Hi Donovan, I'm a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I'm new to this area, having transferred here from the Shenandoah Valley. My wife and I have been married for three years now, and we're expecting our first child in about a month. I was born in Tennessee, but my family moved to Virginia when I was young. I've always loved the woods and animals, so naturally I wanted to go into wildlife management or conservation. I enlisted in the Army right out of high school and joined their conservation program there. After four years of service, I got out with an honorable discharge and applied at several national parks across the country before being accepted here in Tennessee. My wife is also originally from Tennessee. She grew up on a farm just outside of Knoxville before moving to Virginia after high school where she met me at a bar one night while celebrating her 21st birthday with her friends. She's not as outdoorsy as me, though. She prefers staying inside and reading books or watching TV shows, rather than going on hikes or camping like me. Like I said, I was still fairly new to working at the park, so I'm still trying to get used to the area. I received a call that someone near one of the backcountry sites was injured. I headed over there, and about 15 minutes later, I arrived to see a woman sitting on the ground and her leg was bleeding. She was grabbing it in pain. I asked her, are you okay? She replied, I don't know, I think I broke my leg. I called an ambulance and started performing first aid on her leg where there was an open cut. I asked her what happened, and she told me that she was walking the trail when she felt like she was being followed by someone. She started picking up the pace and turned around and saw this large creature walking on the pathway following her. She started running and then the creature began running after her. That's when she tripped on this tight turn on the path where there were some rocks on the other side, which is exactly where I found her. She told me that it appeared tall and muscular with this creepy feminine face. She also mentioned that its arms were extremely long like an ape, and it was covered in this long, thick, brown-reddish fur. When she fell down, it came up close to her and gently reached out its hand like it was trying to help her. At that exact moment, she said she got stung by a yellow jacket and jumped and screamed, and the creature let out this loud yelp and ran off into the woods. I don't know if I buy this story. This lady is basically saying she saw a Sasquatch. Whatever the case may be, she wasn't harmed by it directly. The ambulance showed up a few minutes later and took her to the hospital. Now, I haven't been a park ranger for that long, but I did find your channel and I wanted to send this story to you because even though it's not my encounter, it's an encounter from someone at my park. Now, after I told my wife this story, she'll never come camping with me again. I probably shouldn't have told her. It's true there's a well-known saying about us park rangers. You get paid in sunrises and sunsets. You don't do this job for the pay. And sometimes you have to wonder why we work so hard to get these federal jobs. You must know that the people who are naturally inclined to take these jobs enjoy nature and enjoy complete and utter solitude. It's the most unlikely group of people you'd ever expect to want to work with, and it's probably no secret you have to give up a lot. It's very difficult for any family or for you to meet somebody. You'll work for years and years until you finally can get a permanent spot only to realize that you're kicked out. But if you're a nature freak like I am, there are so many pros to this position. Although just about any job you take has its cons, this one included. I'll let you in on a little story that happened to me a few years back when I was still doing my rounds as a ranger. We had gotten complaints from a campsite at the farther end of the park. I checked this family and myself only a couple days prior. Not the kind that would have a bad attitude, the kind that would be polite and not complain about small, inefficient things. I made my way over there, and I got a chance to talk to the father. He was complaining that there was this horrendous smell of what he thinks was possibly a dead deer nearby. 
He told me he hadn't smelled it the day prior. I went to go check it out myself because when somebody tells you this, you naturally become curious. Now my first thought was that maybe some coyotes got a deer, or maybe a doe, or maybe a doe had just recently died and started rotting and stinking. You never know. So I go back behind the camp. Everything seems okay. I travel a little further, maybe 30 or 40 yards, and there we go. There's this tiny little crevice in the ground. I found a doe, well, at least part of her. Her spine and innards had been torn out from her stomach and chest. This was a very violent death, something that natural predators don't normally seem to do. I've seen the way mountain lions kill, and I've seen the way wolves and coyotes kill. They're all very similar to an extent. They eat the cadaver. They tear things apart, but not like this. This seemed like it was done with human intention or force. This animal also appeared to have four broken legs, as if someone grabbed it and held it down and tore its body open. This was unusual and very grisly. The other odd piece of it, too, was that this smell wasn't coming from this doe. In fact, even though this doe had appeared to be dead for a couple days now, it actually didn't really have much of a smell for whatever reason, and the campers, being about 40 yards away, should not have smelled it at all. Maybe the wind was picking it up. I wasn't sure, it just didn't make much sense to me. So I disposed of the cadaver or whatever was left. That's when I got a call on my radio, saying that another camper on the other side of the park was also complaining of a very similar situation. An overpowering stench of a rotting dead animal and was convinced there was a bear around. I worked my way all the way to the other end of the park and spoke to this individual, a middle-aged man who was camping by himself, complaining about the same thing as the other family. A horrendous stench of death, although this time, when I investigated, I went about as far as a hundred yards outside of his camp into the forest. I couldn't find a trace of the smell, nor could I find the smell myself. I couldn't see any reason why there would be such a smell. I had asked him again the last time he smelled it and how often he had been smelling it, and he said it would come and go, and only started smelling in the past day. I did another thorough investigation by myself, but I couldn't find anything. That was the end of that day. About two days go by and I don't hear anything. No more complaints. The park is somewhat busy too, which is somewhat of a surprise that I didn't get any more complaints. Hopefully whatever it was had passed. Although it's common to find animals, it wasn't common the way that they were dying or the way people were describing smelling them. But I guess I didn't think much of it at the time, considering it was only two individuals that made a small complaint. This is where my story ties its ends. I very distinctly remember this day. I can remember it was pouring down rain, or at least throughout the day. We were having bouts of rain, and I got a complaint from an elderly lady and her husband who seemed to be long-term campers. She complained that she had heard some sort of screaming and smelled the awful same stench that had been described to me by the previous campers. She described it as maybe a deer or something, possibly coyotes tearing apart a deer. She wasn't sure, so this caused me to investigate it further, and maybe I would get to the source of this weird thing going on. But to be able to smell that in the pouring rain, and with all that humidity out, which means it had to be a very strong smell. Now this part of the camp I was at, or part of the park, the brush and the forest were much thicker than other areas. Even more of a surprise that she could smell it, which would mean whatever the odor source was had to have been close by. I think I made it maybe 60 or 70 yards in before I finally found the source after making my way through the brush. I saw what it was that was the source of the smell, and I stopped and had to cover my mouth for fear that I would scream or yell. What I saw in front of me was this large, what I thought was a man, pitch black, from its head to its toe built very wide, 
large, large shoulders, no neck, and kind of a pointed cone head, a barrel-like body in this long gorilla hair, kind of like an orangutan, where it's so long that it kind of hangs off of you. Whatever this thing was that I was looking at, I caught it in the act. It had a doe in its hands, and right before my eyes, it grabbed its head and twisted its head and neck completely off its body, as if it were a mere piece of paper. The motion was completely effortless, and the deer, if being close to dead, was now dead. No questions asked. It did it so smoothly and so fluidly, I don't think that deer ever had time to blink. After the head was pulled off, of course there was lots of blood. This thing grabbed the deer by the back of the legs and threw it over its shoulder like a hunter would who had just killed a rabbit and casually walked off. The smell of death and rotting meat followed with it. Due to the fear of not being believed, mocked, or potentially losing my job, I never said a word to anybody and kept it to myself. I ended up telling the elderly lady that the situation was taken care of and that it was just a dead deer eaten by coyotes and we would have it taken care of for her. After that, I never saw anything like it again. So I don't know if this was a Sasquatch or what it was, but maybe it was coming to the area to hunt. That's just a guess. I don't know anything about them, but I guess that would make sense if they're anything like us humans. Thank you for taking the time to listen and to read my story. I've told a few of my close mates about the same story and I know they always come to the same conclusion. It was probably some unknown animal, but I've been in the woods a lot and I'm not exactly sure what unknown animal would mean, but I guess that's the only way to describe what I heard that day. Because I certainly never saw what it was, but it made itself audibly known. This was somewhere between 2007 and 2008. I was working as a forest ranger at the time doing service work on a closed down trail for maintenance. This would have been in the spring and we were busy prepping it to open it back up to the public. There had been a landslide on several parts of the trail due to having such an incredibly wet fall and winter. You can't just allow the public to walk on these, you know. We have to make sure they are deemed safe. It was roughly 2.30, maybe 3 p.m. in the afternoon. An overcast day, not cold but not warm by any means. Roughly around the end of March. And I don't know exactly at what point I picked up on it, but everything around me fell silent. Just the wind. There was an uneasiness about this silence. I know it's entirely possible for the forest to go quiet, but usually there is a reason for it. Sometimes it means there's a large predator in the area. Other times it could just be because animals aren't out. But there was just something about this, like it wasn't that I just suddenly noticed it. My inner being felt it, if that makes sense to you. And it gave me this incredible uneasiness it made me pick up my pace even faster to get to my destination quicker. I wasn't exactly feeling great about the current circumstances. Although during this, I wasn't thinking about any monsters in the woods or anything like that. I just did not want to be caught off guard. Even if there was a predator like a mountain lion or something like that, I'll never forget this part. I got to a curve in the trail when I stopped dead in my tracks. Off to my right, there's a thick area of brush and trees, and to my left, there's a sharp rock wall. I heard this low growling noise. It was kind of growling like if you continue to come forward, you're going to get attacked, or eaten, or worse. It made me stop, and I looked around searching for a source of this noise, but I couldn't see anything. The foliage was just starting to grow back but still very bare and minimal considering spring had just barely started. And it wasn't at all like May or June where everything is full and lush with leaves and brush. The noise was sounding like it was up in the trees, and not at ground level. But I figured that was impossible because I was looking in the direction that I could have sworn I heard the growling coming from. And there was nothing. 
but it sounded as if it was coming from an animal merely 20 or 30 feet away from me, right off to my 3 o'clock. There was no way to describe it. And then it got deeper and louder and began to get closer to me with still nothing to see. This made me incredibly fearful. There was no reason why I should not be able to see whatever it was growling at me. There was nothing obstructing my field of vision or view. There was also really no object or tree that an animal of this capacity that can make this deep of a growling could hide behind, at least without getting noticed. No, it wasn't a bear and there would have been nowhere for a bear to hide and continue to make that noise. Then I heard a very similar growling noise from off to my left behind me at my 7 o'clock. I quickly turned around again and I didn't see anything. Now I had to keep watch to my left and to my right. I felt like I was in a pretty sticky situation. So I quickly put my back against the sharp rock ledge and slowly walked my way across the path away from these sounds. The growling noise continued but never seemed to move other than to come closer to the spot that I was at on the trail. Maybe I was hallucinating. Maybe I was going crazy. But the farther I got away from that spot, it seems like the sounds of the forest began to come back, even though very minimal. There were still sounds present, and now I was far enough away. I was beginning to hear them again. I ended up talking to my supervisor and told him all the weird stuff that is going on on that trail. And I would appreciate it if I could walk a different way back and have some help. I should mention this before I forget, but at the time, my supervisor and the small team of other rangers that I worked with, we all knew that weird stuff was going on. None of us were strangers to it, and although we didn't mention anything to the public or to anybody else, we all talked about it. So I felt very comfortable opening up to my supervisor and telling him what had happened. He completely understood. Anyway, I'm sorry if my story isn't all that exciting, but I'm pretty sure it was something other than a wolf or a bear, because neither of those animals make that kind of deep growling. I wish I could tell you what I suspect it was, but I never saw it. I don't know. I'll never know, but what I do know is weird stuff like this has gone on in the woods for long, long periods of time, long before I ever became a ranger. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore, and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear, though bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a little bit about myself. Now, I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer anyway. That's partially why I'm sending you this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird stuff happening in the woods, but this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forest. Growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals steal food. They make weird noises and even human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way. Because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years and was an expert outdoorsman, and he was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped right into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, 
even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story, because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal and his flashlight in a backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return, we had sent out a search party to find him. And I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden, other than that the truth seems so messed up and unreal, I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything that I'm going to read to you had been written down over the two days he was out on the backcountry excursion on October 21st. Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day. Started down in the gully where the reports first started, and ended up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Ball Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier I found some tracks in the ground. In the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd. Or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere. Near the tracks, there was this pervasive smell of death, and I assumed a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow, I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd. Morning of day two. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No light so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. October 22nd, night of day two. Stop for the night in the valley, cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, night of day two, second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try to block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. I got the cave entrance crack covered with a large rock and some brush. It'll have to do. The beast is still outside clawing at the crack in the rock. I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because this might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall. Possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier, when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing and suddenly everything was silent. No voices. No hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. 
I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet, knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up on my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. Then the thing dragged me right up against the tree. I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. That agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and preparing myself to die. When the crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it, I ran for my life. I didn't look back, but I knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling and trying to get into the crack. I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking, gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with this putrid smell of impending death. If I make it tonight, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range. But after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looked like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks. More specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches. Something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there. His arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strung out around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing. Not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they had been wearing had been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human voices coming from the woods, and we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. Some are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig. They're like warnings to other hikers who dare to intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. Hi, Donovan. I used to work for the government, and I can tell you that some of the creatures that you speak about do in fact exist. We actually go to great lengths to hide certain creations, genetic experiments, and other things that I can't fully go into here. I can tell you that there are things out there that we have created, but they are not what people think. There is a lot more to the story than most people will ever know. I can tell you that I've seen them with my own eyes. Some are not as big as people make them out to be. I can also tell you that the government has been working on mind control for decades now, and it's getting better all of the time. We've had great success with animals, especially in the Canidae family. I am telling you this because some of the accounts that you read were probably a result of a mind control experiment gone wrong, or maybe even right. The government has been doing this for years, and they keep it under wraps very well. What happens is sometimes these animals, or should I say experiments, get loose and cause havoc in society. So they need to be dealt with in order to protect the public from harm and injury. Some of these animals are basically large dogs with an attitude problem due to their genetic manipulation. 
which gives them human-like attributes such as advanced reasoning skills. They can also be very aggressive and dangerous. I know this all sounds crazy, but I'm telling you the truth. I have seen them with my own eyes, and so have many other workers who work for the government. We keep it under wraps because we don't want the public to panic or fear these creatures. They're just doing what they were created to do. I'm telling you this because I know that you're interested in the truth and not some made-up story. However, there will be people who doubt this, which is why I can send this to you. Because it can easily be passed off as some type of conspiracy, and nothing is ever looked into or researched. When I say research, I'm not talking about what you can find on a Google search. That's almost laughable. There are resources on the dark web that outline some of the things that exist. I say some because no one truly knows, or shall I say, has been exposed to all of the experiments that the government has done over the years. But I must warn you and others not to throw caution to the wind and just start exploring the dark web for answers. Unless you are highly skilled and know how to navigate it, just consider yourself fully exposed and possibly hacked the second you enter. You can research that on your own time. I can't go into great details because honestly, I could write a novel about all of the things that I've witnessed. However, I will share with you one experiment that was conducted in the early 90s. It was a mind control experiment that went horribly wrong with a silverback gorilla. The gorilla was a massive animal and the government wanted to see if they could control its mind. They were successful in doing so at first. We were able to give it advanced instructions and it would perform very detailed tactical maneuvers. However, the experiment ended up going south. We lost control of the gorilla and it killed two scientists and four security personnel. This all took place in an unknown location in the Congo. The gorilla escaped and we were ordered to find it and tranquilize it. I was part of the team that went out to find it. We were able to capture it before it went into a small village. God knows what would have happened if we didn't get there in time. We tranquilized it and placed it into a large crate. We were told to take it to a facility out in the middle of nowhere, and that's exactly what we did. We took the gorilla to this facility and they began working on regaining control of its mind. They were able to do so, but the gorilla was very aggressive towards everyone, so they eventually had to shut the project down. The gorilla was eventually put down because it couldn't be trusted. I'm telling you this story because I want you to know that some of the things you read about are true. I know some will call me crazy and say it's just a hoax, but it's not. I'm telling you the truth. And if you ever get the chance to go out into the Congo and find this facility, do so. It's still there, and they have since moved on to other experiments with animals. They are very successful in manipulating their minds. However, it doesn't always go as planned, which is why we end up having to deal with them from time to time. Most of the stories that I listen to or read about people seeing unexplained stuff happened to them a long time ago. While I don't doubt their credence, this particular story happened to me only a few weeks back. I'm not 100% sure exactly what I saw because I enjoy reading about this stuff. My brain just went there rather fast, then searching for a logical explanation. However, I'm pretty certain that what I saw was a dog man. I was driving back from work one evening down a road that I use every single day. That's when I noticed this dark figure not too far off in front of me. Whatever it was seemed kind of slumped over, and to be honest, my first thought was that it was some type of bear. Although I've never seen a bear here ever, there are bears in my county, so it wasn't too much of a stretch. And this thing appeared to be pretty big despite looking like it was crouched down. I wasn't exactly afraid, but definitely cautious. I moved the car over a little because there wasn't any traffic on the road. And then I slowed down not to spook whatever it was. As I got closer, I could see that it was indeed crouching down. But it almost seemed to be kneeling, as if its arms were folded in front of it. 
I'm sure that sounds weird, but that's what it looked like to me. Almost like this thing was praying, or at least some sort of stance that you might see in church. I was thinking that this was very odd to see this thing in this position. Then as I got close enough, I noticed it was a dog. It was a very huge dog. It must have been almost as big as me. And as I said, it was kneeling so it wasn't even at its full height. I reckon if I had been standing, it would have been around seven feet tall, if not more. The arms, as I've said, were placed upon its knees, and from my vantage point, I could see that it had absolutely massive paws. Of course, the most important part was the head, very similar to a German shepherd. Actually, it seemed to be just staring. It didn't move. And just for a second, I truly wondered if it was some type of brilliant, elaborate prank, although I could not think for the life of me why. Then, as I drove past it, staring at it, it indeed blinked. You can bet I put my foot down on the gas pedal and shot off like a bat out of hell. I did keep checking in my rearview mirror, and that thing never moved. I for sure believed that it was indeed a dogman. I just have no idea why it was sitting there, in plain sight as if it was waiting for something or someone. I've been back up and down that road several times since, and I haven't seen any trace of it. I was hiking on a trail one late evening in Yosemite National Park. I like to hike at night, and it was awesome how the park would remain open for people like me. I decided to go alone this time because I had a lot on my mind, thinking about a new job that was coming up after college. It was September of 2000, and school was all I ever used to do. I never worked because I was so focused on becoming a lawyer. Putting my work into practice was a terrifying idea. I wanted to be ready for it mentally, and exercise helped me with that. So on my hike I went, following trail maps as the night grew dark. Nature was always my go-to for everything throughout my life. I had been hiking for an hour or so, so it was just after 8 p.m. I thought I knew where I was on the map. But up ahead, maybe about 30 feet ahead of me, there was this gate that blocked off a road. The gate had a sign attached to it saying, Danger, no trespassing beyond this point. I had never been this way before, so I was not prepared to see anything about no trespassing. I had to rework my hike so that I could find a safe place to set up camp for the night. So I decided to stop and eat my dinner right there before I turned around and found another spot. As I sat in the twilight, suddenly two bright lights beamed from the trees behind me, shining through some bushes and hitting me so I could see my own shadow on the ground. Before I could turn around, two more shadows of figures appeared on either side of my own. Standing in front of the light were these humanoid-shaped creatures, but it was obvious that their heads were way larger than mine. I didn't understand what I was looking at, and I became petrified. I turned to finally see what was standing over me. About ten feet behind me, these two figures stood under these lights, very tall with long arms and covered what appeared to be gray fur. Their faces were hairless, but humanoid looking, except there were no ears or noses. They didn't seem angry or anything, which surprised me even more, but their eyes were certainly wide and protruding. They could be mistaken for human eyes, I guess, but far creepier. But both held some sort of weapon which resembled a crossbow. It was modern and medieval all at the same time. Whatever they were, they seemed perfectly content doing nothing but staring into my direction through those strange lights. I heard mumbling noises, not discernible words, and I realized that they were talking quietly to each other, most likely about what to do with me. Things got weirder when one really took notice of me staring back at them. He looked into my eyes with this crazy look. I suddenly felt this dread wash over me. He pointed his weapon directly towards me, while otherwise remaining completely still. The other stood motionless and stared at his partner. The one with the weapon shouted at me in a language that I didn't understand. 
I just took off running and never looked back. At first, I could hear crackling, then snapping of branches behind me as they followed not too far behind. I assumed they wanted me to go with them when they shouted, but I wasn't interested in finding out. After what felt like miles, I turned to see that they were gone and there was no trace of them or any lights. My stuff was back at that weird spot along with my map but I was just so happy to get away from them. My heart was pounding and I could feel tears welling up in my eyes, knowing that somehow I got away from something that I would never be able to explain. I couldn't comprehend why they weren't chasing me, except that they most likely wanted to do what we all assume aliens want to do, abduct us and perform experiments. After that incident, I stuck to the more populated trails and areas. I never told anyone. I figured no one would ever believe me. I'm not sure what I saw, but I'm convinced it was something supernatural. In the spring of 2015, I visited an area called Lost Creek Wilderness in Colorado, right at the foothills of the Rockies. It's a forested area with several trails that crisscross. The highest peak is called Bison Peak, and it's exactly the kind of small challenge I wanted to give myself. I went there around 11 a.m. to make sure I had the whole day to complete the journey. I had all my supplies in a tent to set up camp when I reached the top. I was always very prepared. I walked up the first trail, which was relatively close to the main road. There was an open field to the other side. At one point, I could see people playing frisbee or picnicking on the ground. I kept going past them and even waved as I turned left up a hillside, overlooking a field. I stood on the edge and looked over for a moment, taking in everyone enjoying the lovely spring weather. The sun was bright enough, even though it wasn't at its highest in the sky. I took a breath, soaking it all in, but suddenly was disturbed by some bushes moving behind me. I turned to check on what it could be, but I didn't see anything. Figuring it was a bird or something small, I decided to continue up to the peak, getting further away from the people as I went. I didn't hear another noise for a half an hour up the trail, which was actually odd. Ever since that rustling sound, I haven't even heard a bird chirp. I kept going, but slower and slower, with my mind racing about what could have scared the birds away. There was a lot of wildlife at Lost Creek, but there was no way an animal like a deer or a bison could have moved that fast through the brush without continuing to make noise. And then there were other things that may or may not live in that forest, but I was sure that along that trail, not only would I be able to spot the threat, but that it would end up being okay. That moment when I began to pick up my pace and let my guard down, Something knocked very loudly against a tree behind me. Turning quickly, there was nothing but trees everywhere and the trail was empty. I felt like it became darker because of the canopy of the trees. I couldn't make out anything that could be in them. I was beginning to get spooked, which didn't normally happen to me. I began running up the trail towards the next peak, hoping whatever it was would give up following me and leave me alone. It had tracked me silently from that field into the woods. Was it a person, I thought? Fear and worry clouded my mind, forcing my heart to pound faster with each step upward. I heard loose stones near the trail's edge get kicked and a few were propelled far in front of me. Now whatever it was had to be on the path. It had to be seen. I wished afterwards that I hadn't turned around. The first thing that hit me was the smell of a corpse. Then I could see that it was standing about nine feet tall. It had these claws at the end of its fingers which probably helped it remain hidden from tree to tree as it followed me. Its body was like a shambling skeleton with meat and muscle clinging onto the bone for dear life. It swayed a bit with its head cocked sideways. I didn't know what to do except for stare at its skull-like face, gray skin torn and stretched over its beady eyeballs looking down at me. There were tufts of fur in random places with two horns in poor shape, nicked and bent that sat on its head. 
It began shambling forward with these thin legs and hooves where feet should be. Its mouth was salivating and its nose, which was only two holes in its face, was dripping. It was so gross and horrifying, all I could do was drop all of my things and run. I turned and saw it behind me, wobbling back and forth on all fours trying to catch up, but still fast enough that I couldn't stop even for a breath. Suddenly, I came upon another clearing with some people sitting around a creek and decided that I should run through, hoping not to be followed. Sure enough, after stopping at the creek and turning, this strange horned rotted creature was gone. The people at the creek looked at me hyperventilating and sweating and thought I was on something. I waited there for a while in the grass, afraid to go back for my things. Finally, I ran down to where everything was dropped, and it looked like things were gone through savagely. I grabbed what I could and ran, never going back there again. That was my last hiking trip. Hi, Donovan. Retired FBI agent here. I love the channel because I know that these things exist. Before I get to my actual story, I wanted to give you a little background. I just retired last year after 25 plus years of service. I've had some issues with my back which forced me to retire a little earlier than I wanted to. A little background about me. I was born in New York City and lived there until I was about 10 years old. My family moved to the south shore of Long Island, New York, and I grew up there. My father was a career New York City police officer who worked in the narcotics division for many years. He retired when I was about 15 and then became a private investigator. He had his own agency for many years before he passed away in 2005 at the age of 83. So as you can see, my upbringing was steeped heavily in law enforcement. It's something that I've always wanted to do. After I graduated from high school, I went straight into the Army. I served for four years and did my basic training at Fort Benning in Georgia. And then I was stationed in Germany for two years where I was a military police officer. After my enlistment was up, I joined the Federal Bureau of Investigation as a special agent trainee. I went through FLETC. That's the abbreviation for our training centers that we have to attend before becoming an agent, called the Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers. My first assignment was to the Newark Division, where I worked general crimes for about five years, before I was transferred to the White Collar Crime Squad. While there, I investigated bank robberies and other financial institution cases, which were handled by that squad. After 12 years with the FBI, I transferred to the Fort Lauderdale Division, where I worked violent crimes for about six months before being promoted to supervisor of that unit. It was during my time working in violent crimes that we came across one crime that was so violent that some sick individual or terrifying animal had to be responsible for the deaths of four men. We received a call from local police about a group of four men who were found at a campsite completely mauled. The local police had received a call from a woman who was concerned about her husband who had not come home. When the officers arrived at the campsite, they found four men, all dead. The first officer on the scene said that he thought it looked like something out of Jurassic Park because these men were torn to pieces. There were no weapons or anything else at the scene to indicate who or what could have done this. The medical examiner determined that whatever did this was very strong and killed these men by biting them and tearing their bodies apart. He also concluded that it had to be large and extremely powerful. The medical examiner had years of experience and has never witnessed anything of this nature in the past. Day one of the investigation, we arrive on the scene, and it's like nothing I've ever seen before. I had been in law enforcement for a long time, like I just stated, and this was the first time that I've ever seen such carnage. We interviewed family members and friends of the men who were killed and discovered. There were actually five men who went on this camping trip. This was something that they did every year. 
we had to look at fingerprints of the four men because their bodies were so bad you couldn't identify them. After going through this process, we learned who the fifth member of the group was, and he was still out there. Our first priority was to find him if in fact he is still alive. So we start a search and rescue effort to find him. We had helicopters, canine units, and officers on foot looking for this man. The search went on for a day before we finally found him. Day two of the investigation, we had a breakthrough. One of the search and rescue members ended up finding the fifth member of the group, and he was badly injured with a broken arm and some cracked ribs. He was incoherent. We couldn't make sense of anything that he was saying. We had him airlifted to the hospital because we didn't know what else was wrong with him. They started working on him right away. They had to give him some volume to calm him down because he was just so upset. Day three of the investigation, we were finally able to talk to the fifth man of the group. He was calmed down enough and on enough medication that he was pretty relaxed. Although still very upset, he tells us what transpired. I can't remember what he said verbatim, but it went something like this. We arrived at the campsite Friday afternoon and set up camp like we always do. Everything was fine until that night when Mark heard something behind the campsite. We weren't sure what he was talking about, but when we looked over to see what he was referring to, we see these yellow eyes staring back at us. We thought it might have been a black bear, which are not that common, but you do see them occasionally in Florida. So we all start making noise and screaming, Get out of here, bear! Then Jason has the bright idea to throw a rock at it and hits it square on the head. You could hear this loud thud. The animal shook its head and let out this roar. I thought it was a lion the way it roared. For a second, I thought maybe someone in the area had a lion sanctuary and it got loose. After he hit it with a rock is when everything went haywire. The next two minutes were a blur. It wasn't a lion. It was a gigantic wolf creature. I say creature because it's not like any wolf I've ever seen before. It's on all fours with this big hunched back and very weird shaped body because its upper body didn't match its lower body. It was so muscular and so much drool was coming out of its mouth that it was filled with what looked like to be two rows of teeth. It slowly walked out of the darkness and looked around at us. We all grabbed anything that resembled a weapon. We all started yelling at it, and that's when Greg took a swing at it with a hiking stick he was whittling. It broke over its back, and it curled up and lunged at Greg, biting his neck and chest. He went limp as soon as it attacked him. This creature started shaking its head violently like a dog playing with a toy, and ripped Greg to pieces. I immediately turned and started running as fast as I could. It was just a reaction. I couldn't help it. As I ran, I could hear my friends scream and hear this thing tearing them apart. My heart was pumping so fast as I ran. I'm used to running long distances. I was actually training for the Miami Marathon at the time, and I was 12 weeks into my program. I just ran and ran until I couldn't run any longer. I fell down and broke my arm and a few ribs tripping over a log, but I ended up in this old abandoned cabin and just stayed there until they found me. I was in shock. I was paralyzed with fear and didn't want to move. It also hurt to move. Thank God you guys found me. So that was his story. His story lines up with what we saw at the crime scene too. There's no way a human being could do this type of damage to four men. The investigation continued for a few more months, and we never found anything else. I've never seen anything like this in my life. It was the most gruesome crime scene I've ever been to. I wanted to send this to you because we never did find what caused this, but I'm convinced it was something that is supernatural or not of this world. Because for the life of me, I cannot figure out how any creature on earth could so violently kill four men. Thanks for your time.
A few years ago, I was staying with a buddy in his huge rambling farmhouse out in rural Texas. When I say rural Texas, I mean it. This place is out there. This place was massive and had a ton of land surrounding it. We were both writers, or should I say, aspiring writers. And it was the perfect place for us both to lock ourselves away and get on with the novels we were planning. There were plenty of deer on the property, just wandering around aimlessly. And my buddy was pretty protective of them. A couple of times over the last week or so, we found one mauled to death at the edge of his land. Never pretty. And it upset him a lot. I mean, this guy loved doe, especially doe, mainly because we never saw any big bucks around. It was just a large congregation of doe everywhere. He would set out apples for them to eat. He also had salt licks, anything to have them stick around and draw them in. I think his plan was to befriend one. When it happened for the third time, the deer being mutilated and found, despite it being what can happen often in nature... He decided to put down coyote traps, as he assumed that that was hurting his deer. Like I just explained, he became pretty obsessive and very possessive of his deer. Maybe it was a coincidence, but there wasn't another tack for a few weeks. So he was sure that the traps had driven away the coyotes. I mean, this was a good thing. As we had seen a few fawns, and then he was beginning to get really anxious that they would be easy pickings if the coyotes returned. After all, fawns are pretty defenseless. He even took to sleeping downstairs, a shotgun next to the door so he could rush out and help if needed. I thought he was crazy. But then it does get crazier because one night, we both heard an unmistakable howl outside. Even as a writer... Although we both pen crime drama, nothing in the horror genre, I would struggle to put in words exactly what it sounded like. So the term howl is the best that I can come up with. I think it's the most single terrifying noise that I've ever experienced. And I was in the delivery room with my wife when she gave birth to our twins without painkillers. Needless to say, I bolted down the stairs to find my buddy and the gun gone and the front door was wide open. I threw on some boots since you never walk outside in Texas without boots and ran down to the traps. And that's when I saw it for the first time. Despite standing with the gun aimed right at it, my buddy was frozen. I mean, I can't say I blame him. For there, in the trap was what I can only describe as a wolf man. Now I heard the audible gasp. The disbelief. Why on earth would I jump to that conclusion? Surely it was just a large coyote or maybe a wolf. Well, let me ask you this. Did you ever see a coyote stand on two legs just like a person and walk upright? Did you ever see one that had a long skinny body and arms with hands resembling that of a raccoon's? Not paws and not human hands. Have you ever seen one covered in hair so dark that it literally absorbed the light around it? And have you ever looked at its face and thought, that looks like a wild dog but with human eyes? I bet you haven't. This thing was caught in the coyote trap. It was huge, taller than both me and my buddy, and we're both around six feet tall. This thing was mad, viscerally angry, Veins popping, mouth frothing, as it pulled violently against the trap. Shoot, I whispered to my buddy, and he just seemed to snap out of his trance. He raised his gun and fired off a shot. Now he's a pretty good aim, but I think the fear overtook him so much, which led to unsteady hands and the shot went wide. What it did achieve, however, was to fire up this thing even more. It gave another howl. Although now being closer, it almost sounded like a human scream, like the Incredible Hulk. It ripped itself out of the trap. We were now the ones screaming and the gun was going off as my buddy was just shooting wildly at this thing, like he was playing a first-person shooter game. 
I don't know how he could have missed every shot, but we'll never know because this creature wolf thing ran off and never came towards us and seemed to be more pissed at being caught than wanting to hurt us or retaliate. The deer, of course, had all fled due to the commotion, and I felt like it took quite some time for them to feel brave enough or safe enough to come back and graze. We both stayed up all night those next few days, guns in hand, ready to shoot at first sight of it coming again. Well, it never did. My buddy installs all sorts of expensive security equipment, cameras, etc. But nothing like that thing has ever been seen or heard on the property ever again. We'll never know what exactly what it was, and if it was hurt or if there was more. But what I'll never forget is seeing a human-like body with a dog's head and human eyes. It's by far the worst thing I've ever experienced. And I hope to God that I never see anything like that again. Hi Donovan, a recent subscriber here. I'm glad I found your channel because I research this stuff all of the time. I believe the government is involved with cryptids somehow. The reason I say this is because I have a good friend who was on a task force where their mission was to capture one. This happened a few years ago when he was active in the army. He was stationed in Germany and was sent out on a specific mission in Germany's Black Forest. He told me that he was in a squad of eight highly trained soldiers. They were dropped in a remote area of the forest by helicopter, and their mission was to tranquilize this creature, then airlift it out of the location. He said his superiors described it as a large bipedal wolf-like creature, that is approximately 350 to 400 pounds in size. It's extremely fast and extremely dangerous if provoked. They showed them surveillance footage of this creature attacking a small German village and killing several people. He said it was extremely fast and agile. It jumped over a six-foot fence in one leap and ran through the woods like it was nothing. He said they were dropped off in the forest at night by helicopter. They had to hike about an hour until they found the exact location where it was last spotted using thermal imaging. Then they set up their gear and began to wait for it to appear, so they could tranquilize it with darts from their rifles. They sat there all night but never saw anything except wildlife such as deer, foxes, and owls. About 5 a.m. before dawn, they were getting ready to move out, and that's when he said all hell broke loose. The creature appeared in front of them out of nowhere. He described it as being seven foot tall, covered in dark brown fur with black stripes on its arms and legs. Its face looked like a wolf's face with pointed ears. It stood there staring at them for about five seconds and then took off deeper into the woods. Several members of his squad fired tranquilizer darts at it, but it didn't seem to phase it. They began following it deeper into the woods. He said they were tracking this creature for about two hours when it finally stopped running and turned around to face them. He said it let out this blood-curdling scream that he described as sounding like a mix between a wolf and a human. He said it was so loud and so terrifying. He's never heard anything like that before and he's been in combat several times. Then the creature jumped into a tree and climbed up about 30 feet. The soldiers were shocked by this. They had tranquilizer rounds that could stop a grizzly, but none of them would even phase this thing. They fired at least three more darts into it, and after 30 seconds, it comes crashing down, breaking the branches before landing on the ground with this huge thud. He said it was still not totally out and groggy, and it was showing its teeth at them while they were surrounding it. They radioed in for the helicopter, and then they put this creature on a very thick net and were able to airlift it in the next 30 minutes. He was up close and personal with this thing for about 30 minutes before the helicopter came, and he said it was the craziest thing that he's ever seen. It had these huge tendons on its legs like it was built to jump 20 feet in the air. 
Its back and chest were very muscular and very overdeveloped for its body. And the smell was just awful. He said it was hard to get close without vomiting. There was never any follow-up with the soldiers after that mission. He had no idea where they took it or why they took it there. They probably took it to some German-based lab, I'm assuming, to run further tests. Two years ago, I moved to Traverse City, Michigan for work. Things were going well with the new job and I was confident I'd be at the company for a while. So after living there for a year, I also bought a small lake house on the upper edge of Lake Michigan. It was a small, basic cabin, but it was good enough for the weekends away and for a few weeks of the summer. I bought the cabin in the fall, but I only got to spend a few weekends there before that winter. I had two huskies, and they loved the cabin. Finally, my first extended stay was in July, when I took a two full weeks of vacation. I spent the first days walking the dogs along the lakeshore, canoeing and just hanging out relaxing. It was just what I needed. Occasionally, I would walk the dogs through this wooded area behind the cabin, but I didn't do it much because nearly every time I did, the dogs caught scent of something that caused them to go berserk. They were normally really chill dogs, but they would start barking and pulling on their leashes like crazy. I'd have to drag them out of that area, and even then they didn't calm down until we got back to the cabin. I assumed it was something like a family of raccoons because a few mornings I had found my garbage cans knocked over. Then one night I woke up in the middle of the night by the dogs. They were barking like crazy, and it seemed like they were trying to break down the back door. I turned on the light to look outside, but I didn't see anything. I got the dogs back to the bedroom and locked the door. Eventually they settled down. But just as I was getting ready to go back to bed, I heard it. It was some kind of howling noise. That must have been what set the dogs off in the first place, and I just missed it because I was asleep. Having huskies, I was more than familiar with dog howls. But it wasn't that type of howl. It wasn't a canine howl. It also didn't sound like coyotes or anything else that I've ever heard before. I made sure all the doors and the windows were locked tight, and then I went back to bed, glad to have the dogs as a warning system. The next day, I stopped in the general store to pick up some supplies that I had forgotten to bring. The cashier was an older man, and very friendly and chatty, so I decided to ask him about the howls that I heard the night before. I asked if he knew of any wolves in the area or something similar. When I did, he gave me this really weird look. After a long pause, he told me that the town's people talk of his strange animal in those woods, and that no one had ever seen it, but folks would occasionally call the police after hearing the sounds, or after having trouble with property damage. He specifically told me to always keep my dogs on their leashes, because in a few rare instances, pets had gone missing. I went back to the cabin more than a little concerned. I had bought that cabin as a refuge, a place to get away from work stress in the city. The last thing I wanted was to be worrying about some wild animal attacking me or my dogs. Over the last year, I'd became friends with a few of my co-workers, and I knew one had grown up in the area. I gave him a call that day to see if he knew anything about this local legend. When I told him what the old man said, he just laughed. It had been some kind of folk tale that he had heard as a kid, but it wasn't real. Some kind of Bigfoot creature. He suggested that I do what the guy said and just keep an eye on the dogs, but otherwise not to worry about it. Feeling a little bit better, I let it go. The rest of the week passed without any issues, but the night before I left, the dogs woke me up again. This time, they were barking and scratching at the door. Frustrated, I turned on the light and looked out again. I had put a canoe oar inside and next to the door the other day, just in case I needed it. I picked it up and I stepped outside. I didn't go more than a few steps. I wasn't that crazy, but I wanted to see if there was anything out there. As I got outside the cabin, I could hear a sound. 
Not the howling sound from earlier, but a heavy breathing sound. I was starting to wonder if there was just a stray dog in the woods. It would explain the scavenging in the way my dogs had reacted. I stood near the back door, waiting and watching. At this point, I just wanted to know what I was dealing with. All of the sudden, the dogs flipped out again, barking and yipping from the bedroom. I jumped, startled. I turned to yell at them when I saw something darting around the side of the cabin. It was outside the circle of light, so I could only see a tall shadow. I held up the oar as a sad weapon and stared into the darkness. This creature crept closer to me until I could finally see it more clearly. I was awestruck. It was this huge man covered in dark brown fur. It almost looked like a cross between a bear and an ape. It was so muscular and so huge, then it opened its mouth and it let out this terrifying roar. I could see all of its teeth as it tilted its head back. Without thinking, I chucked the oar at it and dove back for the door. I slammed it shut and locked it and pushed a small kitchen table in front of it. Then I ran back into the bedroom and closed and locked that door. I huddled in that room with the dogs until morning. I didn't sleep a wink that night and occasionally heard sounds around the cabin, but I count myself as lucky that that thing didn't try to come in. In the morning, I packed everything up and ran for the car, and I got the hell out of there. On my way out of town, I stopped to see that old man who was the cashier at the general store, and I told him what I had seen. He gave me a half grin and told me it was only a matter of time until it came back again. The next week, I put the cabin on the market. Before I became a teacher, I had a short-lived career as a park ranger. I had grown up in a heavily forested area and had been an avid hiker and a camper, so it seemed like it would be a fun and easy job. Right after college, I got hired by the National Park Service and had a brief placement in Utah before being relocated to Tennessee specifically the Smoky Mountains. It was a beautiful area and I was looking forward to spending the summer there. Instead, I got the summer of hell. It started well enough. As a newbie, I was doing a lot of patrolling and routine safety checks, which was fine by me. I got to roam around the gigantic park and sometimes going hours without seeing anyone. A few weeks in, I got the first weird call. A family had reported animal tracks around their site. It wasn't a big deal, all parks have wildlife. But when I got there and saw what I saw, I thought one of the other rangers was messing with me. That maybe it was a hazing thing for a newbie, me. There were tracks, but they were weird. They definitely weren't canine or bear. They were human-shaped, but huge, and with claws at the end. I checked out the area and took some pictures, and then helped the family get another campsite. I turned the pictures into my boss, expecting her to laugh and give up the joke, but instead she was pissed. She thought I was the one playing the joke. I asked her to come out to the site with me, but by the time we did, the rain had washed away the prints. Two weeks later, I got another call. This one was worse. The campsite had been completely trashed. The tents were shredded and everything was destroyed. Luckily, the campers hadn't been there at the time. This camp was in a grassy area, so there weren't any footprints, but I did find some light brown tufts of fur on the ground. This time, my boss saw the destruction herself, but she marked it in the books as a bear attack. The fur didn't look anything like a bear's, though. It was much longer. Finally, in early August, I got a call about a lost pet. A young couple had been walking their dog and it had slipped its collar and taken off into the woods. They were devastated. A few of the other newer rangers and I got picked to head into the woods and try to find the dog. We broke off into pairs and I was teamed up with this guy named Brian. He was a decent guy. I had sort of become friends with him the last few months of working there. We walked for about 30 minutes doing our best to cover our area. We whistled and called out, but didn't see any sign of the dog. There were two hours left of daylight, and we hadn't gotten any other pressing calls. 
So we agreed to stay out until dark before going back to the parking lot. As the sun started setting, we turned around and made a beeline for the nearest trail. We still had maybe 20 minutes or so until we got to the trail. And then we would have another 15 minutes on the trail itself. We felt bad about not finding the dog, but there was nothing else that we could do. Halfway to the trail, we started hearing these noises. Growling sounds. A low howl. The missing dog was a lab, and they didn't howl like that. It was almost dusk, so inside the forest it was getting difficult to see. We looked around but couldn't identify the source of the sounds. We kept walking, hoping to leave whatever it was far behind. At the time, Brian and I noticed this odd-looking tree. It looked like it had been mauled. Huge scratch marks and missing branches. I pulled out my flashlight and looked around the base of the tree. There again were these huge footprints, and they weren't a bear's. They were just like the ones I had seen months ago. They were huge, but human-like, claws at the end and narrow. This time, though, someone else was seeing them with me. Brian's eyes got huge, and he started swearing. We were suddenly very aware that we were alone in the forest. It was nearly dark, and we were still far from help. We picked up our pace, going as quickly as we could into the twilight. We kept hearing these crashing sounds and grunting sounds, but kept moving. Twice I saw a dark shape run past, but the trees made it impossible to see what it was. It was large and tall, which was concerning to say the least. We were nearly running as we approached the trail, or where we thought the trail was. We had to be within yards of it when the creature barreled out of the woods and crashed right into us. I had a glimpse of a dog-like face before it knocked me in the brian, and we went tumbling down the slope together. We rolled for seconds before hitting a tree. I looked back up the hill to get a better look at what had come at us. Staring down at us with these glowing eyes was a creature I thought only existed in people's imagination. It continued staring at us and growling as we locked eyes. Drool was dripping from its mouth, which had me petrified. Brian was frozen too, staring at the creature with its dark matted fur towering above us. Then, in the next second, it took off running into the woods. Finally, I snapped to and grabbed a large branch for a weapon, and Brian and I limped out of the forest, bruised and sore. It was well past dark by the time we got to the parking lot. The other rangers were waiting for us. They were worried and asked why we were so late. Under the lights, they could see that we were totally scraped up, and we explained what had happened. Before they could even respond, I showed them the shallow claw marks on my shoulder where the creature had hit me. I told them it was some kind of dog or wolf walking upright because I had no idea how else to describe it. Even though I had Brian backing me up, no one believed us. My boss was just pissed at me again and threatened to reassign me. Instead, I quit. I had enough of whatever the hell this thing was roaming in those woods. Coincidentally, the missing dog was never found. This happened about two weeks ago when I was fishing on my property just outside of a little town in Georgia. My property has been in the family for several generations. I grew up here and been fishing here all my life, and I'll be 70 years old come this October. I know the woods and swamps around here like the back of my hand. We have about 50 acres of land and one of my favorite fishing spots is a small lake on our property. It's maybe three acres in size. The water comes from an underground spring, so it's fresh water. I go fishing Sunday nights and I usually take my grandson out with me, but he was out of town this week so I decided to go by myself. I've been doing this pretty much every weekend for the past 10 years. I started fishing from my canoe and really wasn't able to catch much, so I went over to one of my favorite spots on the shore where there's a lot of shade from the trees. After about 10 minutes of fishing, I hear this thrashing sound coming from my right. The lake goes back into this little cove where the trees are really dense. It was coming from there. It sounded like an animal thrashing around trying to get through the brush. I thought maybe it was a deer or something caught in those briars. So I walked over through this little trail that we had formed over the years 
to see what was going on. When I got back there, all was quiet again. But when I started walking around the cove looking for whatever had made that noise, I noticed this strong odor coming from one spot under some bushes near a tree trunk. It smelled like something dead that had been lying out in the sun for several days. That kind of smell can knock you down if you're not expecting it. But this wasn't too bad because there was also a faint odor of musk with it that helped take away some of that sting from the dead smell. I didn't see anything at first because the sun was just starting to set and the brush was pretty thick. But then I noticed something right before I decided to head back. I could see it clearly, but it looked like this giant winged bird eating something. I could half see its body in the back of its head. It had these huge wings that were folded up and looked gray and smooth, and it had its head down like it was eating something, possibly an animal. I have never seen a bird this large before. I yelled at it to see if I could get it to turn around, and when it did, it swung its head around and looked right at me. It had these huge red eyes that almost looked like they were powered by LEDs or something. It was definitely eating something because its beak was covered in blood. It stood up and started shaking its wings as it was making this screaming sound. It was terrifying. It reminded me something right out of a Jurassic World movie because I just recently took my grandson to see the latest movie about a month ago. In all my years, I've never seen something like this. When it stood up, it had to be at least as tall as I was. I slowly started walking backwards from on the trail to my ATV I had parked on the shoreline. As I started backing away, this thing turned around and kept on eating whatever it was eating. I finally got to my ATV and drove back to the house. My wife was in the kitchen when I got home, and I told her what had happened. I wanted to do something, but I just didn't know what to do. I wasn't going back down there because now it was starting to get dark, and I'm not going to call animal control and tell them that I just saw a dinosaur. We live in a small town and word gets around real quick. I don't want it getting out that I'm some crazy old man. I found your channel because I started researching the internet after I had this encounter and I was trying to figure out what I saw. I still don't know what it is because it doesn't quite match anything out there exactly. Maybe someone out there who has seen this will come forward. Thanks for your time. I was about 14 years old when I had my first encounter. It was the summer of 1976 and my family had just moved to a new house in the country outside of Granite Falls, Minnesota. My dad had just started a new job at the paper mill and we were getting settled into our new home. The house was situated on several acres of land that backed up to thick woods. We didn't have any neighbors yet as everyone lived further down the road towards town. One night, sometime around 10 p.m., I was awakened by some strange noises coming from outside my bedroom window. At first, I thought it might be kids goofing off, but what I heard next sent chills down my spine. There were these very loud screams coming from the woods behind our house. They sounded like they came from something much larger than a person. These screams lasted for about five minutes, then stopped abruptly. After listening for a few moments, I realized that whatever it was has got to be standing outside my bedroom window, which faced the backyard and the woods. A few moments later, there were sounds again coming from right outside my window. This time, it sounded like something was being thrown against the wall of my bedroom. I could hear things being thrown and hitting the side of the house as well. My brother, who was sleeping in the next room, woke up at all the commotion and came into my room to see what was going on. We both sat in my bed trying to figure out what was happening when we heard a loud thud right outside my window. We quickly turned on our lamp and looked over at the window just in time to see a dark figure moving away from our window towards the back of the house. The figure was moving so fast We both were scared out of our minds, but also curious about what we had just seen. Now, my brother and I were quite the daredevils back then. 
So after a few moments, we decided to go outside and try to find some clues as to what might have been responsible for all the strange noises and exactly what that dark figure was. When we opened our front door, there were no lights on inside or outside of our home, which made things even more creepy than they already were. We slowly walked down off of our front porch towards the back of the house. We walked around the side of the house and noticed that there were these large footprints in the soft dirt where we had been planning a patio for our new home. The prints were much larger than anything I've ever seen before. These footprints were huge. We followed the tracks down towards the woods behind our house, only to have them disappear once they reached an area covered in dry leaves. We decided it was probably best to go inside because it was getting late. We also didn't have any weapons on us to defend ourselves. After going back inside, I went into my bedroom and turned on my light, just as I heard another loud scream coming from the woods behind our house. The next morning, I told my mom about everything that had happened during the night. She thought maybe someone might have been messing around with us, but quickly changed her mind after seeing the large footprints outside of our window. We all agreed that whatever it was must have been much larger than a person. A few nights later, my brother and I decided to go outside after everyone had gone to bed to see if we could hear anything unusual going on around our house. We were determined to see whatever this creature was. We walked out onto our front porch and sat down on the steps leading up to the porch. It was very quiet except for the sounds of animals in the woods around us. After a few moments, we heard a noise coming from the woods behind our house. It sounded like something large moving through the underbrush towards our house. That's when we saw it. This large hairy figure coming from out of the woods swaying back and forth as it walked towards our house. We both immediately jumped and went inside, and I started yelling for my parents. They came running downstairs and asked us what is going on. We told them that there was a large hairy man that came out of the woods. My dad turned on the back porch light and saw something walking back into the woods. I asked him, did you see it, dad? His face turned white as a ghost. All he said to us is, you kids need to get into bed. Come on, go upstairs. I mentioned it to my dad since, but he always changes the subject. My brother and I know we saw Bigfoot that night. I've been ordered not to share this story since it involves law enforcement and also because no one would ever believe it. So now I'm butchering my credibility by not telling you where I'm from or where this took place. But that's okay. I feel like the exposure of this story is more important than anything else. So I'm okay keeping things anonymous. I was off duty and driving through a residential neighborhood, because why not? Things happen in broad daylight in places that could easily be next door. So I made a pass through your average suburbia. There was this three-story house that seemed to have a cul-de-sac all to itself. And no sooner had I passed it, I heard gunshots and screaming. I mentally patted myself on the back for deciding to turn through here. I got out and charged the door with my service pistol drawn. I crashed through the front door and yelled that the police were on premises. The house had no answer. This bothered me. Things just don't go from 0 to 100 then right back to 0. I did a full sweep of the lower level of the house, all while calling out warning signs to any perpetrators. The ground level was empty. I went up the first flight of steps I could find and there was a swath of blood all along the white carpet that led from one room to another. I picked a direction and followed. My choice brought me to where things had started, a bedroom where there were apparent bullet holes in the wall, with blood spattering, so somebody had landed their rounds. Also, a bed that was not only bathed in blood, but shredded up in ways that shouldn't have been possible. I sized it up to somebody that had fired shots in self-defense, but their attacker wasn't stopped, and they must have had a machete or something, because the level of violence displayed on this bed was ridiculous. This wasn't just a war, this was a massacre. 
something heinous happened. So I continued to follow the trail of blood in the opposite way. It led to a very strange oddity, a closed-up stairwell that went into the basement down below. I wouldn't have found it on the ground floor. It was accessible only from the basement and from the second story. I had never heard of a house having this or ever seen any sort of construction like this before, but I digress. The trail of blood went down the carpeted steps, down into the basement where the lights were off. So I gripped my gun tightly and slowly made my descent. I steeled myself and proceeded, changing my tactics to being quiet. Anybody that makes this big of a mess had to be some type of serial killer or something, so I shouldn't take my chances. Of course, what are the chances that this would all happen when I was off duty, and I just got to be part of it? The basement looked to be mostly a man cave and down there I saw signs of another struggle when I flicked on the lights. Well, they didn't stay on for very long. I heard a flick from somewhere else, and they went off. I tried the same light switch, and the lights came back on. And again, they went off. I yelled that I knew they were down there, and they needed to stop playing games. What happened next was so fast to this day I still doubt my own memory. It was too bizarre too strange. I flicked on the lights for the third time and charged my way into the basement as silently as possible, keeping my weapon ready and drawn. I wanted to catch where the sound of the other switch was coming from, and I found it. I honed in on it. I produced my tactical light and told whoever was in the cone of the light to freeze. Clutching a bloody and mutilated body was simply a monster straight out of the nightmares of any person. It was a wolf with long legs and long arms and blood-matted fur all around its face. But this wasn't just a wolf. It was standing upright like that of a man. It even had the body and length of a man and the chest and arms and the shoulders. This was basically a muscle-bound man covered in thick matted fur with an extremely large head of a wolf. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This was like out of a horror movie. It stood so tall that the ceiling forced it to hunch over. I emptied my entire magazine into it. It dropped the body and almost danced around the room, swatting at the bullets like they were flies. Even though I knew I hit this thing, somehow I lost sight of it in the darkness. Even though I knew I hit this thing, somehow I lost sight of it in the darkness. It escaped the cone of light from my tactical light. I had no idea where it had gone, and it was gone. I did a double check of the room. Every nook and cranny was scoured through and covered, but I never saw any trace of it or where it could have gone. I even checked back upstairs. Even though it would have been impossible to get up there without me knowing, I never found it. I had the coroner show up, and they took the bodies away. The thing had killed four people inside the house, and was taking them to the basement. I waited for the story to drop, but it never did. When I asked about it, I was told that I would keep my mouth shut if I wanted to keep my job and not be persecuted, among other heinous things. I'm sorry, but I have to tell somebody. The case was kept very, very quiet, and in fact, even the family was told by other family members that the people died under mysterious circumstances. Not even so much as an animal attack. It was unusual. I believe the higher-ups knew something that I didn't. Because when I tried to explain to them what I saw, I was quickly dismissed and threatened with lots of horrible things. That's my story. Hi, Donovan. Let me first start off by saying I really enjoy the show. And thanks for posting content on a regular basis. I became fascinated with cryptids after my 2018 encounter. Well, I should say a sighting rather than an encounter. This took place when I was on-site working for one of our clients. I'm a safety consultant, and one of my clients is a power company that has about 30 wind turbines in western Pennsylvania. I was doing a safety inspection on the FAA lighting on top of the wind turbine. We go up at least once a quarter to do routine inspections. The first few times I had to do these inspections were a little freaky because sometimes I have to crawl through this 18-inch hatch 
on the nose of the turbine. Now getting up one of these wind turbines is quite the task, unless you're going up one with an elevator. Most of them have sections of ladders where you have to climb up 300 feet to the top. The first time I climbed, my arms were just dead. We do have some people who can climb in four minutes, and I've even seen one guy take six hours to get to the top and three hours to get down. However, he was pushing about 400 pounds. Anyway, so I'm up there doing an inspection with another employee at our safety firm. We always go up in pairs to make sure we're tied off properly, and most tasks just require two people. We're looking around for a bit, just taking in the view before we begin our inspection, because it took us 35 minutes to get to the top. It's a gorgeous view from the top. It's like being on top of a building and looking out over a city. However, the turbine is in the middle of a field and is surrounded by woods on all sides. There are trees everywhere, as well as brush and grass. We were 300 feet up in the air, so you can imagine the view was breathtaking. Everything, of course, looks a lot smaller from up there, but my coworker also brought a small set of binoculars with him. When I looked over to the east, I saw what appeared to be this really large animal in a clearing just outside of the woods. It's hard to tell, but it looked like it was laying down. I couldn't make out any other details other than the fact that it was very large. It looked like this brownish gray color, and it just blended in with the grass and brush around it. I asked my coworker if I could use his binoculars, and he handed them to me. I tried looking for a few minutes, but... It just blended in with the landscape. Then I saw it stand up. It was standing up and walking on two legs. It looked like a very large bear with an ape-like face, almost human and really broad shoulders. It was walking around picking berries and eating them. I'm standing there watching this creature. Then I say, holy hell, I think that is a Sasquatch. My coworker immediately grabs the binoculars from me and says, give those to me. Let me see what you're looking at. The next words out of his mouth were, holy crap, dude, you're right. What is it doing here? I said, I have no idea. We were up there for another 20 minutes looking at this thing before we finally had to get our safety inspections done. When we finished our inspections, we looked again, but it must have left because we couldn't find it anywhere. After we climbed down, we talked with one of the workers at the power company about what we saw. And he said, oh, you saw Harry too? I was like, what? Harry? He said, yeah, we call him Harry. We see him quite often when we do maintenance up there. There's about six of us who tried to go out and locate him on the ground several times, but we never find him. He's got to be super aware of his surroundings because he is never seen on the ground. I got to be part of a hiking expedition that occurred out in the Rockies, and in a very swift moment, I had been turned around and separated from the other hikers. This is a hiker's worst nightmare. I was very inexperienced at the time. I found myself in a landscape that was not consistent with what I knew about the Rocky Mountains. The ground turned coarse and full of rubble. Plants seemed practically non-existent, and a thick mist was rising, cutting me off from getting my bearings. Worse yet, I couldn't hear the group at all. Several times I tried screaming at the top of my lungs, just to see if I could get anybody to answer me. There was nothing. Nothing but the faintest sound around me. In fact, sometimes it seemed like nature itself was silent, shushing me to stay silent with it. The first sign that things were not right was the article of clothing I found. I came across a pink denim cap of one of the people that had been hiking in my group. I didn't remember the girl's name, but I distinctively remember that faded pink cap for some reason. I am one of those people that can remember far more details than I can a person's name. But that's just how it is. I picked that up with the intention of eventually returning it to her. I dared to take the sight of the hat as a sign of hope. Perhaps I was near them after all. But how could she have dropped the hat and not realized? It didn't really make sense. The hope was short-lived when I came across a backpack that had also belonged to someone in my group, 
but I couldn't place who it was. I continued through the thickening fog with a distinct feeling that I was going in circles. My rations and supplies were very limited. If this continued, I would have no choice but to perish out here all alone. I came across another possession of one of my track mates. This time, there was a new level of bad news. It was a bandana that I remember seeing on one of the guys with spiked hair. It was stained with something dark and red, and I knew what that was. I just didn't want to admit it. I couldn't fathom my brain going there. It was at that point that I began to feel panic stalking me from a distance. My first thought was that robbers had come upon my group. Or maybe not robbers, but modern day bandits. I don't know. Something had clearly happened to them. I hadn't heard any noise that would suggest a big bear or big cat attack. No screaming, no crying, nothing. I even looked in the dirt. There didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. It's as if their clothing had just fallen. So I quickened my pace, with the visibility reducing by the minute. And the things I could see were things that I didn't want to. I came across a pair of shattered glasses that were all too similar to the pair worn by the Asian girl in my group. Then there was the torn sports bra that was also bloodstained. One article after another that I could recognize as being from my group emerged out of the fog as I pressed onward, and my own sanity was beginning to teeter, so I broke into a light jog. Even though the ground and the visibility was treacherous, the path began to lower with the unusual rocky ground rising on either side of me. Then, just like that, the trail went into a small cave. Small enough that if I wanted to get inside, I would have had to stoop down. Something inside me wanted to turn and run, but my curiosity overrode my primal caution. So I struck up my lighter and reached into the cave. What came next, I remember only in parts because my mind evidently was closer to breaking than I had realized at that time. The halo of the flame showed nothing but rock at first, but then a pair of eyes had turned to me from somewhere at the edge of the light's influence, and then another, and more. Then the light showed me towering furry bodies that were hunched at the back as if they were all used to a life of crouching and hiding. I hate to tell you this part because it's going to sound like I'm crazy, but I can only tell you exactly what they resembled, and what they resembled were werewolves. That's the worst word to use with the complete overexposure that this thing has gotten, but honestly, there's no other word to describe what animal I saw. Their teeth extended well past their lips, and I can tell you that they had long ears that looked like horns almost. Their mouths were busy chewing and gnashing something. I could hear the sounds of ripping and tearing. It was meat. They were eating on something that I couldn't see. I immediately worked my way out, and they didn't give chase. I'll never know why. Maybe there's a reason they didn't get to me. I'll never know. After climbing my way out, luckily I eventually found a trail, even though I was completely and utterly traumatized. I ended up contacting the authorities, and they did a very thorough investigation and did a search of the area, but didn't uncover anything, which is surprising. I told them about the bloody clothes and all the belongings they had left behind, that they were attacked by large unknown predators. They didn't really seem to take my story seriously. In fact, I was even a suspect in a potential murder since they disappeared, but nothing they found was conclusive. I even told them there was a cave where these beasts lived in. I understand this story is sounding more and more crazy as I go on, but this is my experience that I have to live with, forever, for the rest of my life. I don't get to just shut it off. And then, of course, after all of that, I have the trauma of dealing with being a potential suspect in their disappearance, which didn't result in anything because, like I said, they couldn't find anything conclusive that led to me. Anyway, they're all gone now. This was almost nine years ago, and I still have to live with that pain. And I've only told a handful of people, in hopes that somebody can give me reassurance that things will be okay, 
and that I'll be able to get through this. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me about 10 years ago when we first moved into our house. We live in the countryside in a small remote neighborhood. I have a job in the city so it takes about an hour to commute to work, but I never minded it. I liked the idea of having some privacy to think and play any music I wanted. I also wanted my kids to grow up around clean, fresh air so the drive was worth it. I typically would leave work late at night when it was already getting dark. I'm a realtor, so usually after a day of showing houses, I have some paperwork to finish. Sometimes this means that I'm not heading home until 9 or 10 at night. The road I take to get home is really rural. It has no street lights and it's surrounded by forest on both sides. I always had to rely on my headlights to help guide me. One night, I was on my way home when off in the distance I could make out a group of elk running across the street. They were plentiful in this part of Pennsylvania and not unusual to see them in the woods. But this time, as I got closer to the spot where the elk had passed, something huge ran in front of my car, so fast that I barely got a look at it. It looked like it might have been a bear, but moved faster than any bear that I've seen. The movement made me jump in my seat, turning my steering wheel and swerving the car into the ditch in the side of the road. My head jolted forward on impact and hit the steering wheel. The windshield had cracked from the impact, and I lifted my hand to check out my head and felt blood running down the side of my face, but I felt I was okay for the most part. I lifted my head to look in the rearview mirror to check out my face, and that's when I saw it, standing behind the car in the middle of the road. The body was sort of like a man, but it was covered in hair. This dark brown hair, but it had the face of an ape. It was huge, and with me being down in the ditch, it loomed over the car in the moonlight. The creature took a few steps towards the car, then stopped as if it heard something in the woods. It lifted its head and sniffed the air, and then it took off in the direction of the elk. I got out of my car and looked around. I wasn't sure what I had seen. This thing was very muscular, and it didn't make a sound until I heard the screams followed by a powerful yelping noise. On this section of the road, I didn't have any signal on my cell phone. I wasn't exactly sure how to explain what I had just seen when I got home. The ditch was deep and muddy, which made it difficult for the tires to pull out. After trying for a bit, I got out of the car and realized it just wasn't happening. I had just dug myself deeper in the mud trying to get out. I waited around for a while to see if a car might drive by. But when none came, I decided to walk home, thinking that in the morning I would call a tow truck. I was only about five miles from home, which in the car might be around ten minutes, but I still had an hour of walking at least. While I was grabbing some stuff from the car, I looked behind me in the direction the animals ran. It's not like I was going to follow them, but for a brief moment, it looked like something was staring at me from the brush. I took a deep breath and focused on making my way home, praying that a car might come along this backcountry road to give me a ride back. Thankfully, I had brought a flashlight with me, so I was able to use that. I hadn't gotten far when I heard rustling and saw movement in the bushes along the side of the road. I shined my light in that direction, but the movement stopped. Now I started to get spooked and sped up my pace. It wasn't long until I started to hear the bushes move again. Then, out of nowhere, I heard a scream. But before I could look and turn in that direction, an elk ran past, within inches of me, almost knocking me to the ground. I started to run as fast as I could. I heard this yelping sound behind me, and at the same time, I saw headlights approaching. I flagged down the oncoming car to ask the driver if I could get a ride in the direction of my house. The man, who looked to be in his 60s, said that it wouldn't be a problem. He said that he was headed in that direction anyway. And then he asked me what I was doing out here this late at night. I explained to him what had happened, that I swerved to avoid hitting an animal with my car, and I ended up in the ditch. He seemed interested and started asking me questions about the animal. I was hesitant at first, but then I decided to explain exactly what I saw a big, hairy, ape-like animal standing upright. 
that let out this high-pitched scream that sounded like a human. The man listened quietly. I thought for sure he thought I was drunk or something. I eventually got dropped off in my house and was able to pick up my car the next day. When they towed my car, they said the front driver's side window was completely smashed in and the entire car smelt horrible. Hi Donovan, I love the show and I just wanted to say thanks in advance for reading my story. It's not actually my story, it's my grandfather's. My grandfather told me this story before he passed away. This happened when he was in Vietnam. He was a soldier in the Vietnam War and was stationed at an outpost somewhere in the Central Highlands. He said that he was on guard duty at an outpost that had a fence around it in the middle of the jungle. He had to keep guard during the night. The Viet Cong carried little with them and they moved pretty quickly. They stayed hidden during the day and came out at night to sneak in the villages, catch American soldiers in ambushes and other missions. The Viet Cong used to dress like farmers. American soldiers didn't know who was a farmer and who was a farmer fighting for the Viet Cong. He fought on the ground in Vietnam, which was different from what U.S. soldiers had done before. There were no front lines in Vietnam. The war was everywhere. A peasant who seems harmless could be a guerrilla. A pretty prostitute could be a secret agent. And the kid who brought the laundry could be a spy. Flooded rice fields hid spikes. The jungles were full of booby traps. And the enemy could easily attack barracks. He told me that they had this steel container at their outpost that was dropped off by helicopter shortly after they set up the outpost. It was a 12 by 12 by 12 steel cube, basically. This was a small outpost, so there was less than a dozen men there. Nothing that could withstand an attack from a larger group of VCs. They weren't told much about what was in that steel container when it was dropped off, but his commander said it's our secret weapon. That's all he really said. He thought it was some type of weapon or a bomb at the time, and it ended up being a very destructive weapon. However, I'll get to that in a minute. A few days goes by and he's doing night watch on their guard tower, when he notices some movement on the jungle floor. He can pick up someone talking in Vietnamese, in radios to the soldiers on the ground that they have company about 50 to 75 yards to their east. From what he can tell, there's at least two dozen men, and they are outnumbered easily two to one. He receives radio confirmation from one of the soldiers on the ground. And 30 seconds later, he hears the commander give instructions to the ground team to open the vault. What happened next, my grandfather had a first row seat to the carnage and mayhem that pursued. He said that the ground team opened up that steel container and something came out of it. He said it looked like a cross between a wolf, a man, and a hyena. It had dark brown hair all over its body in this long snout. The thing had arms like a man, but they were longer than normal. It had very broad shoulders and it was muscular, almost like a gorilla. It walked out on all fours, then it stood up on its hind legs, which had to put it at at least seven feet tall. And it jumped from the ground over a 12-foot fence with ease. It blended in so well with the terrain as it moved through the jungle floor. My grandfather said he was up in his post watching this all unfold with his night vision on. This thing sniffs in the air like it was getting a read on where all of these men were at. Once done, it gets on all fours and swiftly and quickly started moving towards the enemy soldiers. Everything went dead silent. No more talking. No more movement that you could audibly hear. It's like someone just froze the jungle in that moment of time. No bug sounds or animals. The next thing he hears is this ungodly sounding screaming howling noise and the sound of people screaming in pain. The creature started tearing through the soldiers on the ground, killing them easily with its massive hands and jaws. My grandfather said he could hear screams coming from the men on the ground as this creature killed them one by one effortlessly. Gunfire was going off randomly and even a few grenades went off. 
After about 10 minutes of this carnage, this thing heads back to the outpost, jumps over the fence, and goes back into the vault. This creature had this thick metal collar on it like it was being summoned back to its vault. My grandfather said that the collar was flashing red as it went back into the vault. The commander gets on the radio and tells the ground team to lock up the vault. About 30 minutes later, a helicopter comes flying over and airlifts the vault out of there. The next day, they venture out into the jungle outside of the outpost and collect the weapons of all those dead soldiers. He said they were torn apart and some looked like they went through a shredding machine. There were a few men in that outpost that knew what was going on, but he didn't. It was like they were testing this creature out there. After all, it was the perfect place to do it, as that war was fought in the jungle. He told me that he never found out what it was, but he referred to it as the demon wolf. I asked him if he thought maybe it was some type of mutant animal, but he told me that he believed with everything in him that it was some sort of government-created creature designed to be a killing machine. My grandfather told me this story before he passed away last year, at age 76 years old. Thanks again for reading my story. I spent a lot of time in upstate New York. There are a ton of people that I've gotten to know there, and they've led me to so many out-of-the-way places that I wouldn't have known otherwise. I've spent time on farms and lakeside cabins. I've slept in a commune with my hippie friends. I had thought I had seen it all. But nothing prepared me for what was coming. One year, a little before Halloween, a friend invited me to escape the city for a week to avoid the craziness of the season and clear my head. I was all about it. She told me that instead of staying with her on the commune, we would be heading into the woods and camping out with nothing but tents and the stars. I remember my mother complaining about me being out in the wilderness what she called being with the wildlife, but I figured that she just didn't understand. People from the city think there are wolves and mountain lions and bears everywhere when you walk into the woods. I just packed my bag and told my mother goodbye, explaining that I have been to so many places before. This would just be another interesting experience. I wasn't the only person my friend invited, which helped. The more people, the less likely wildlife would bother us. And they say that animals are more afraid of you than you are of them. I just wanted to enjoy my time away without feeling neurotic. Being in a group of 10 instead of 2 would help ensure that coyotes wouldn't just walk up to us. As the first night of the trip got going, there was a guitar playing and dancing. People were gathered around the fire. Some were inebriated and some weren't. I personally had a few drinks, but nothing crazy. The fire began to die down around midnight, and all the tents in our little clearing between the trees began to fill up with tired hippies. I was getting ready to follow everyone to bed, but I had the urge to take advantage of the quiet time to sit alone by the dying fire and enjoy the breeze that passed through. Everyone said goodnight as they walked by. Shortly after, I heard rustling in the trees. I didn't think much of it. I figured it was someone who had wandered back from the woods. But when the rustling stopped and no one emerged, I took my last sip of my drink and set it down. I looked towards the spot where the rustling was coming from, and still no one. That's when I noticed these two red dots a little ways into the trees. They were lined up like eyes, but I had never in all of my travels seen any animals or people with eyes like that. I wanted to get a closer look. I took a few steps towards the trees. The clearing was coming to an end and the shadows of the trees started covering me. This only made the red dots glow brighter. I looked up at the sky for a moment. There was not much light coming down because the moon was waning. When I looked back down to the trees, those eyes were gone. I stood still for a moment. Maybe I was seeing things. I didn't usually drink, so I started blaming it on the alcohol. Suddenly, I heard more rustling behind me. I heard heavy breathing coming from behind me, too, and then I felt something warm and wet drip onto my neck down the back of my shirt. 
I froze and I didn't dare turn around. I stood there paralyzed for a few seconds. It looked like whatever was behind me was almost as tall as the tree next to me. I couldn't make out much from the shadow because of how dark it was, but I could hear it from its breathing, and it didn't sound human. I thought maybe it was a bear, but I figured that a bear would not have stayed silent and would have mauled me by now. Something was very different about this creature. I heard grunting and saw from the shadow that it was moving slowly. Then I heard it walk away, its footsteps heavy on the ground. I was still paralyzed by fear, but I wanted to know what it was and why it spared me. Surely bears and mountain lions would just attack. Slowly I turned my body in the direction of the footsteps. What I saw I could never unsee. There was this large creature. It had to be at least eight foot tall walking across this clearing. It looked like an extremely large ape. I could make out that it had this very dark fur in the dim light of the embers from the fire. I could also see that it was very muscular. It looked like a huge, hairy bodybuilder. I stood there in awe as it walked by the tents, ignoring the people inside. But since it was walking away, I never got to see its face. There was one point as I turned my body completely around that it seemed to stop. Its hearing must have been fine-tuned. I stopped moving too. I didn't even breathe. I watched this thing as it started walking into the woods. The trees and bushes around it were rustling again. After a minute, I let myself breathe again. When it disappeared, I ran into my tent and I began sharing with my friend what I just saw. They told me it was probably a bear, but I know it wasn't a bear. I was sure I saw those eyes a few more times on that trip but I never saw that creature again. It's strange how when I tell people what I saw, they usually fire back with an explanation. Well, it was probably this, or I think it might have been that. They all do it. They all have a suggestion of what I might have seen or what I probably saw. They never let themselves consider what I saw might actually be what I saw. It makes me laugh because they say it quickly too. Like no sooner have I said the words and they fire back with one of their theories. It's like a reflex action that they just can't help. Like their brains say, no, this challenges what we know. This can't be true and those things aren't real. I did see what I saw. I saw it as plainly as I see my hand before my face. It was solid. It was there and it was real, and no attempt to explain it away is going to convince me otherwise. I had been at the fairground. They set up the rides and booths on Markham's Fields about twice a year. You always know it's coming because you'll see the usual flyers plastered all over town. Anyway, I always love these local fairs and particularly the rides. I don't know about you, but there's something about the fact that a ride wasn't there a week ago and that it's been unloaded from the back of someone's truck and put together with a screwdriver and a monkey wrench that makes them ten times scarier than the rides you get at Six Flags or Disneyland. It gives them that added element of danger, that in addition to the speed and the movement of the rides, they might not have been put together all that well. Of course, you rarely hear of anyone actually being hurt on these rides, otherwise they'd be shut down. And I'm sure there's all kinds of safety checks. But still, the impromptuness of the entire thing gives it that added element of danger. So last June, a few friends and I headed down to the fair. After a lot of needling, we managed to convince Donna, who hates these kind of rides, to go on the Kraken. The Kraken is a huge eight-arm contraption. You sit in one carriage with four other people. The ride has eight total carriages, each at the end of one of the mechanical arms, and they all get lifted into the air. The entire contraption spins, and the carriages themselves spin too. There were four of us, and only three spaces in one of the carriages. I let Donna and the others get into that one, and I got into one by myself. Partly pleased because the carriages with less weight tend to spin faster and give you a better ride. We waved to each other and set off. 
Once the ride started, though, and just as we were being lifted into the air, I happened to glance towards the tree line, and that's when I saw it. It was standing, hunched against one of the trees and watching the crowd. I'd seen nature documentaries where you see wolves and lions standing on the edge of the brush, using trees as camouflage, and they eye up their prey. This was the same thing. This thing just wasn't watching out of curiosity. It was panning, selecting, and weighing up its next move. It was bigger than any man or ape that I had ever seen. Judging by the size of the trees, I would probably say it's somewhere between six to eight feet tall. It was standing up on its hind legs like a person, with this sort of backward lean as if the hips were different from ours. From the glimpses that I got, it seemed to be hunched and it wasn't a person. I think the best way I could describe it, it would be a cross between a dog and a man, or the kind of creature you'd see in some horror films, as if the head of some massive wolf had just been put onto the shoulders of a man. It was covered from head to toe in matted brown hair. But you could tell from the way it was built that it was a powerful animal, and if it wanted to leap out and grab someone, it could. I screamed, but of course so was everyone else, because of the ride. I pointed frantically at the trees trying to get someone's attention, to warn them that this thing was there. But as the ride kicked into gear, I got spun around and my view was altered. Soon enough, I was facing away from the tree line, trying my best against the G-force to turn in my seat, to look back over my shoulder and see it again. All I saw were quick flashes of it, tiny snatched glimpses. By the time the ride finished, the creature was gone. I kept scanning the trees to try and see it again and to show it to the others. I tried to explain to them how it looked, how it had a canine head, a muscular body, sharp, piercing, intelligent eyes. And all I got back was a quick fire explanations as to what they thought it could have been. I saw what I saw. Sometimes when I'm all alone at night, I still see it. I can't seem to get it out of my head. It's something that shouldn't exist, but it does.